What's up guys, my name's Rosh and welcome to part one of another episode of Skeptics Say the Dumbest Things. The video we're looking at today is called A Historian Looks at Climate Change and it's by a chap called John Robson. John is a historian who runs a website and YouTube channel called The Climate Discussion Nexus, which describes itself as a forum for more open debate on all aspects of climate change. Now, as always, I've put a link to the original video in the description, and I encourage you all to go and watch it beforehand. It's quite long, but if you want to have some fun while watching, I suggest counting the logical fallacies that you can find. Think of it like fallacy bingo. Anyway, I've broken John's video into eight core arguments, which are summarised here, and we'll address the first four today. The rest will be addressed in part two. Now, you'll notice that the first argument isn't even about climate change, but John spends the first third of his video on just this point alone, so I think it's worth addressing here. But before we hear what John has to say, I want to make one thing clear. When answering scientific questions, the only thing that matters is observable, measurable evidence. The opinions of scientists, no matter how esteemed they may be, are ultimately irrelevant, and opinion without evidence is, scientifically speaking, worthless. So what's this got to do with Dr John Robson? Well, it seems that in the past he's had people commenting on his videos, calling him out for being a historian rather than a climate scientist. In the period of time that we've been making CDN videos and newsletters, periodically someone will ferret out the apparently scandalous information that I'm a historian and wave it about in triumph. Like this guy who commented on one of our YouTube threads that, quote, he said he was a doctor, but never said in what. Why is that? Oh, I checked. His doctorate is in history. I guess he didn't want us to know that, end quote. <laughs> Now John rightly takes issue with this, because it implies that his lack of expertise is sufficient reason to dismiss his opinions on climate change. That's not true. The reason we should dismiss his opinions on climate change are because they are directly contradicted by the evidence. But we'll get to that later. Now John stays on this point for a while, and in principle he is right. His lack of expertise does not make him wrong, just as being an expert does not make someone else right. But unfortunately, that's the last logically sound argument that John makes. After questioning why we value expert opinion, he goes on to say this. So, if we really believed in this business about experts, we turn everything over to the professoriate instead. Would we? Why? This just doesn't logically follow. And it's our first logical fallacy, the slippery slope fallacy. Just because I value the medical opinion of a doctor over Kevin Numbnuts does not mean that I want to hand everything over to doctors. And yet, for some reason, rule by experts is something which John seems rather hung up on. One virtue of historical training is that you get some understanding of what has been dangerous to self-government in the past and what has helped to save it and preserve liberty. And unfortunately, rule by experts tends to be in the dangerous to self-government column. Watch out guys, if you start valuing the opinions of experts over non-experts, you'll inevitably end up with communism. Okay, so John doesn't explicitly say this, but if we follow the core points of his argument, this is more or less where it ends up. Not only has he extended his slippery slope fallacy, he's also set up a straw man, because as far as I know, no one is advocating for expert rule. And to top it all off, he's constructed a false dichotomy, making out that we have to choose between expert rule and democracy, as if those are the only two options. In short, he has framed valuing expertise as a threat to our freedom. Obviously this is a ridiculous argument, and John is very careful to avoid explicitly stating it like this. Indeed, if we are being charitable, we might interpret this all as a tongue-in-cheek critique of those who appeal to authority rather than evidence. Keep that in mind for later, by the way. But regardless of the intention of his argument, John doubles down on this simplistic and moronic model of reality by framing common sense as the essence of self-government, presumably in contrast to expertise. Relying on common sense as the essence of self-government instead is a far better idea. And it's an old one. But what does that actually mean? As I'm sure any good historian would know, common sense has been shown to be wrong numerous times. It tells us that the Earth is flat and stationary, 
that the planets and the sun revolve around us, and that heavier objects fall faster than lighter ones. The only reason we know these things to be wrong is because people who some might consider experts applied the scientific method and followed the evidence. Oh, and appealing to common sense also happens to be a logical fallacy, by the way. But there's more. Remember when I said that John's whole line of argument might just be a mischievous dig at those who appeal to authority? Yeah, guess what he does next. There's something that William Pitt the Elder said in the British Parliament in 1770 that I'd like to bring up here, and yes, it's the sort of thing that historians know. Yep, you guessed it. He appeals to authority. Quoting William Pitt the Elder, who shares his opinion on common sense. And if it was unclear at this point where John stands on this false dichotomy he's constructed, he makes his position quite clear with yet another appeal to authority. I would rather take my stand with another historian here, William F. Buckley, who once famously remarked, quote, I'd rather entrust the government of the United States to the first 400 people listed in the Boston Telephone Directory than to the faculty of Harvard University, end quote. Okay, so we get it. John doesn't trust experts and believes that they are a potential threat to democracy. Fine, that's his opinion, but it's an opinion notably lacking in evidence. Anyway, after eight minutes of waffle about experts, John finally gets to his second argument and his first on climate change. As historians, we're trained to seek the key to the present and to the future in the past. And so as soon as man-made global warming became a thing, and I was told that CO2 was going to overheat the planet, I asked myself a natural historian question. I said, is there anything in the past record of the planet to suggest that CO2 drives temperature? That's a good question. But John seems to be under the impression that the idea of man-made global warming is recent. It's not. It's been a thing since at least the 1950s. But before we get to the evidence from the past, it's worth discussing how we know that CO2 has a warming effect on the planet today. The greenhouse effect of CO2 was first discovered and demonstrated by experiment over a hundred years ago, and can be directly measured in the atmosphere today via infrared spectroscopy. By the 1970s, numerous studies concluded that rising levels of CO2 in the atmosphere would cause global warming, and since then experiments, observations, and direct measurements all demonstrate this to be true. But is there evidence that this has occurred in the geological past? Well, yes. The first piece of evidence has as much to do with the sun as it does with CO2, because the study of our sun reveals that the further back in time we go, the weaker solar output becomes. Indeed, for much of Earth's history, solar luminosity was so low that the Earth should have been freezing. Indeed, it was at times, and these periods are known as the snowball Earth. But there are notable periods when temperatures rose to above those of today, despite the sun being considerably weaker. So if the sun was too weak to support the temperatures we observe in the paleo record, then how do we explain this apparently miraculous warmth? Well, paleoclimate evidence reveals that these warm periods coincided with periods of elevated CO2, and when the combined effect of the sun and CO2 were accounted for, then the temperature record is neatly explained. Indeed, these are the two most important drivers of climate change on geological timescales. And since CO2 levels can fluctuate much more erratically and much more rapidly than solar output, it is CO2 which has been the primary driver of climate change in the past. But don't take my word for it, this is the conclusion of numerous research studies, like this one, which reveals the role of CO2 in the warming at the Permian-Triassic boundary. Or these ones revealing that CO2 was a dominant driver of climate change throughout the Mesozoic, including during the Triassic, the Jurassic, and the Cretaceous. Indeed, these studies reveal that CO2 continued to play a significant role into the Cenozoic, and in particular during the Paleocene-Eocene thermal maximum. And when CO2 levels have declined, it has often triggered glaciations, as these papers reveal during the Huronian, Cryogenian, Late Ordovician, and throughout the Paleozoic. In fact, the paleoclimate evidence is so strong that researchers have concluded that CO2 has been the primary driver of climate for at least the last half billion years, the eon known as the Phanerozoic. So as you can see, there is a wealth of paleoclimate research which demonstrates that CO2 has driven temperature in the past. So surely John will at least acknowledge that this exists. It doesn't matter on what scale you look, there just doesn't seem to be any connection between CO2 and temperature. Which makes it very fishy to claim that it suddenly became the dominant factor right around the time that 
Pierre Trudeau became Prime Minister of Canada. <laughs> I mean, were any of you really surprised? Either John's unaware of the vast amount of evidence contradicting his claims, or he's simply ignoring it. But I don't suppose his viewers will mind, as long as he's making out that Canadian Liberals are in bed with Communism. It seems John prefers to question motives rather than debate facts and logic. Which, come to think of it, reminds me of something I saw in his website. Hmm. I'm not alone in thinking the past matters, by the way. It's something you're also likely to hear from geologists and earth scientists. For instance, Professor of Earth Environmental Sciences Ian Plymer from Australia, when he was registering serious doubts about climate orthodoxy, began by saying, I'm a geologist, and the one thing that we miss out on in looking at climate change is the past." End quote. Oh look, John's appealing to authority again. But as I said in the beginning, the opinion of a scientist, no matter how esteemed they may be, is totally irrelevant unless it can be supported by evidence. Professor Plymer's opinion is not only lacking evidence, but as we've just seen, is actively contradicted by it. And as far as I can tell, the only person ignoring the geological evidence here is John. So that's his second argument covered. His next claim, however, is actually grounded in some science. And incidentally, it's too bad Al Gore's not a historian, because in an inconvenient truth, he famously laid two charts of CO2 and temperature over the last 700,000 years atop one another, and he went, gotcha. But it was actually a horrendous gaffe. They do correlate more closely than one normally finds, at least in the sense of being small waves on top of bigger ones. But the problem is in those small waves, it's temperature that moves first, and CO2 follows with a lag of around 800 years. Yes, Al Gore was wrong to suggest that changes in CO2 were the trigger of these warming periods. And John is right that changes in temperature did come before changes in CO2. And that's because CO2 is not the causal factor here. These cycles are driven by changes in Earth's orbit which subtly affect the amount and distribution of solar energy received by the planet over thousands of years. These slight changes in temperature then trigger feedbacks which amplify the warming or cooling further, and one of these feedbacks is the release of CO2 from the oceans as they warm, which is why CO2 appears to follow temperature. But CO2 only follows temperature in the southern hemisphere. Paleoclimate evidence reveals that the warming in the tropics actually occurs centuries later, at the same time as the release of CO2. And in the Arctic, the warming occurs after the CO2 begins to rise. Indeed, if we look at the planet as a whole, represented here by the blue line, 90% of the warming actually occurs after the CO2, represented by the yellow dots, begins to rise. In other words, the release of CO2 from the Southern Ocean turns the regional warming around Antarctica into a global phenomenon, spreading the warming northwards. Without this extra CO2, the warming caused by orbital changes alone would be much smaller than what we observe in the geological record. But of course, John doesn't provide any of this information, and instead makes out that CO2 had no role in the warming at all. He goes on to say this. You're not going to find a lot of scientists thinking that effect can precede cause, any more than you will historians. Which is true, but you will find scientists concluding that CO2 is a major factor in driving these cycles. And to be honest, John really should know this, because the paper he cited in his own video, the one which says that CO2 follows temperature, also explicitly states that CO2 did in fact contribute to the warming of these cycles. So either John didn't read the paper he used in his own video, or he ignored the bits which contradicted his claims. I must be pretty stupid. Ah, don't be so harsh on yourself, John, but do us all a favour next time and make sure you actually read your source material properly, okay? Now, on to John's next point. If it is true that a warming Earth tends to degas from the oceans, and a cooling one tends to absorb CO2 into the oceans, well, what was happening about 800 years before the present? Right the medieval warm period. So what we could be seeing now is the carbon cycle going into a long accumulating phase as a typically delayed reaction to that warming. It's just speculation, but if it is true, it would at least be consistent with what we know of the past. Great thinking, John. We'll make a scientist of you yet. Okay, so now John has a hypothesis. We have to find a way of testing it. If he's right, what would we expect to see? Well, among other things, there would be a decrease in the CO2 content of the oceans. 
It stands to reason, right? If CO2 is leaving the oceans to enter the atmosphere, then the amount of CO2 dissolved in the oceans should decrease. Unfortunately for John, measurements from around the world all show that the oceans are gaining CO2, not losing it. So unless he can explain how the oceans can simultaneously be a net source and a net sink of CO2, then it's safe to say that his hypothesis is, to use a scientific term, total bollocks. But anyway, that's the last of John's claims that we'll be covering today. So far, his arguments have been conspicuously lacking in verifiable evidence, but at least his liberal use of logical fallacies has provided some entertainment. I'll be covering John's remaining claims in part two, which will be uploaded soon, so stay tuned for that. As always, sources are in the description, and if you want to be notified when part two is out, then don't forget to subscribe and smash that bell icon. A like and a comment wouldn't harm either. I hope you've enjoyed the video, and I look forward to seeing you for part two. Until next time, goodbye.